Good evening, welcome to tonight's meeting of the Homelessness uh, Subcommittee. I'll start with apologies for absence. We've got a couple. We've got uh, Councillor Thomas J, Councillor Shui People, and no sign yet of Councillor Paul Turner. Anybody else, Tracy? That's it, isn't it? Okay, we'll move on to uh, item two, minutes of the previous meeting. You were there, weren't you? Well, I'll, I think they look good to me. Are you happy to second them, Michelle? In the absence of anyone else, more than happy to second them. Well, let's hope so, else we can't do that. Um, good. Well, that's passed then. Uh, declarations of interest. I've not got one. Have you got any, Michelle? No. No declarations of interest. Uh, item four. NC Social Housing Regulation Bill and Council Housing Compliance. A lovely report by Tina Mustafa. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Chair. Um, a fairly detailed report, as you've referred to in your pack. Um, so the purpose of this is to update the committee on our preparedness for the Social Housing Regulation Bill that's still making its way through the parliamentary process and we're anticipating it within the next um, six to 12 months. Um, and as well, to set out the emerging tenant satisfaction measures that we're required to upload to the regulators portal by April of this year. Um, so you'll recall, Chair, um, councillors, that the conversations around the, our preparedness for this started over the last 18 months, really, and have continued during that time. Um, so th in terms of the tenant satisfaction measures, what's in your pack is um, the working draft of information that's going to be provided um, in terms of the 10 key performance measures around complaints, around largely repairs and in terms of antisocial behaviour. There are 22 tenant satisfaction measures altogether. Um, the other 12 relate to perception measures or relate to satisfaction measures which um, for those of you who have worked with housing colleagues for some time will know that used to be the status or the star survey that we undertook. Um, so there are some proposals in the report which talks about um, how we might obtain that information over the next um, six months because we have to submit that by the end of the next financial year. So the priorities on the key uh, performance measures and on that particular data capture. Um, you'll also see in section four of the report that we um, reported to cabinet on our overall, the overall picture and on the overall journey um, and we are due to update corporate scrutiny on the 9th of March on the improvement plan um, and we had a pre-meeting with the chair and vice chair um, January and agreed that the um, discussion around that improvement plan will be very much focused on priorities etc. Um, so there are two um, members of the tenant consultative group who usually attend tonight but um, unfortunately are unable to um, but equally the opportunity is there for tenants to also influence our discussions around that. Um, so yes the report sort of sets out quite a lot of detail chair so I'm happy to focus the discussion on uh, any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Tina, and thanks for the report. Um, it's nice and detailed. I mean, obviously, we've been through this a lot, and it's been through various different committees. Um, so I don't have any questions at this moment, but I'll open it up to the floor, or just Michelle. Thanks. Um, no, I mean, it Sarah say in many ways it's a statement of fact, it's where we are at the moment. I mean, I know it's going to corporate, obviously, um, relatively shortly, so I'm sure the committee will have questions on it there. Just one thing that I did have when I was reading through the actual report, the um, links at the very bottom of the report, the last one on um, reshaping consumer regulation is it clicks through but if you click onto the improvement plan it takes you to your um, Tamworth Borough Council login which means it wouldn't have been accessible to members of the public so I'm just a flagging that um, and secondly saying can we make sure that is updated and uploaded in time for corporate scrutiny but, um, just in case because I know sometimes if you click it on a TBC machine it automatically takes you through and you wouldn't realize I know it's happened historically so um, that but otherwise i think yeah let's kind of send it to corporate and go from there 
Absolutely. I mean, in terms of the improvement plan, it was attached to the Cabinet report in November. Um, corporate scrutiny have had a detailed presentation already on that as well on the 17th of November. Um, so that is in the public domain around that. But absolutely, we'll make sure that, you know, that's available, um, you know, to anybody outside of the intranet. Thank you. Yeah, um, I've just tested it on mine and, and you're right, Michelle, it does go to the... Uh, internal link um but no it's uh, like you say it's a statement of fact and um it's it's a piece of compliance that we we're, we're doing in the best way possible uh, any further questions michelle no okay so uh we'll then move on to are you happy tina if, to, to move on thank you we'll move on to item five which is a uh, damp and mold in council housing properties and Paul Weston, this is yours. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So this is a, I suppose, a brief update report uh, following the tragic death that you'll all be aware of uh, in a uh, council property where a young child passed away and the coroner attributed that to prolonged exposure to uh, severe damp and mould. Uh, following on from that, there's obviously been a, a lot of media attention uh, and a lot of public attention to uh, to damp and mould and in particular in sort of rented properties. Uh, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities and the Regulator for Social Housing made contact with all social housing providers to remind them of their obligations and also to sort of get a feel for what they were doing, what they knew uh, and how they were dealing with damp and mould in properties. Uh, Obviously, they were taking it very seriously uh, and were making sure that housing providers were also taking it seriously. In order to sort of formulate that response back to the regulator for social housing, we did, we did a desktop exercise where we looked at our repairs history uh, to pick up sort of where we got damp and mould cases and trying to find sort of trends and information on that one. I think prior to sort of recent events and the media exposure, our report rates for damp and mould have been fairly consistent year on year. As you would anticipate, when it's big in the public eye, it becomes more prominent and more people report it. So we have seen an uptick in sort of the the number of uh, incidents reported, uh, but not significantly. It's always been within our repairs policy. Uh, there's been a section on damp and mould and how people can sort of help to treat it and what they can report and what they can expect from us in dealing with damp and mould. Uh, clearly, you know, it's never never always going to be straightforward. There's sometimes where, you know, it's a structural issue, leaks, uh, you know, pipe work or perhaps roof leaks or th things like that, which, you know, I'm not sure really we, we normally see as being damp as such because it's a leak and we deal with it as a leak and then it's... The, the, the damp should dry out afterwards once the de leak's dealt with. So really, we sort of look at where it's, it's I suppose, an unknown cause uh, and how that could be picked up. I suppose one, one thing that we did find in looking at the data is that, unfortunately, there's no real trend in terms of what type of properties, what locations or anything else. So there's, not, there's nothing you could pinpoint and say a certain property type or a certain property in certain areas are particularly prone to uh, condensation and mould, more so than any other properties in any area. Family homes were more prone to it, but then we have more family homes, and you'd expect, you know, potentially certainly with condensation, with more people in a property, that that would be the case. So what we, what we don't have is a position where we can sort of target homes and say, right, we know that this type of property is a problem, and we'll target those because our data doesn't support that at the moment. We've looked at the historic repairs reporting. We've reissued the condensation and mould leaflet that has been on our website for some time now. And I believe that was sent out with rent statements or was going out with rent statements uh, just as a, an update for tenants. And that's more around sort of how people can sort of help to you know, reduce the amount of condensation in a property. Uh, it won't necessarily address those issues where they're structural, but it will address those issues where it's just about just the natural moisture getting into the air. Uh, Equons, our contractor, have carried out toolbox talks with all of their operatives, so they're sort of looking out for signs and issues of uh, damp and condensation. 
also they are looking at sort of if they go into properties and they can see something that is likely to cause a problem they're also helping to identify that so that you know the, that education process can be uh, sorted because i think you know there is there is room in there for education and talking to people around sort of how they can help to alleviate some of the problems themselves we've set up new scheduled rates codes within our repairs reporting system to specifically identify damp and mold inspections as being separate to any other type of repair. What that does is it allows us to monitor it and then track it. So again, one of the things that the regulator for social housing was looking for is that when you have a report, you actually follow it through and, and you know what's happening with that uh, case. So having that schedule of rights code allows us to do that and we can track that job through and know where it's coming from. In terms of future actions, we've got some training booked in for our staff. They have had some uh, some training on this already, but there's some more formal training booked in, and we're looking to sort of include some of the housing sort of teams on that, those who are involved in sort of the housing management activities. The repairs policy, we're just reviewing again, just to make sure it covers what we need to in terms of uh, damp and mould uh, condensation. And it looks as though probably good practice would be a specific sort of policy or guidance setting out how we would deal with uh, damp condensation and moulding properties. So that's something we just need to consider and how we action that one. Uh, other things we're looking at is the purchase of some monitoring equipment to put in people's homes. Predominantly that will be properties where there are issues that we can't immediately pinpoint. So it's, it's those properties where there's no obvious causes. So it's trying to sort of monitor over a period of time to see what the causes might be that does have its potential issues in the sense of you know it's recording data around sort of what's going on in the home it's only sort of temperature and uh relative humidity data but it's sort of you know it, it is invasive to some degree so that, that will require consent uh but what that will do is possibly help us to identify what those causes might be uh, and help to support i think one of the things that we will see and have been seeing is with cost of living uh, issues and the cost of heating homes we all know that sort of temperature in a property is a contributory factor to condensation there's no getting around that fact and of course if people aren't heating the homes or are only heating individual rooms that's almost certainly going to in some properties lead to further issues with condensation which if not dealt with can lead on to uh, mold growth not sure we have an answer to that one i'm afraid because you know if, if people can't afford to heat the homes as a whole home uh and, have cho and are choosing to just sort of use portable heaters in one room at a time there's not a great deal we can do about it but if we understand that and we know how people are uh, behaving in their properties we can at least help and support them where we can and certainly there's some options there around sort of uh, you know interventions and sort of financial support or financial assistance uh so that you know people can heat the homes properly uh you know we, we're seeing people obviously you've seen again on the news where people are having forced uh prepayment meters installed in the properties because they can't keep on top of the bills we are seeing more people where they simply just don't have gas turned on at all in the property anymore because they're you know they're not they're not topping up the meters so that does mean that you know their only form of heating really is going to be probably a single heat out that they just move around the house as they move around the house uh, so th there are issues there i think you know as we go on there'll be more more monitoring we'll keep a monitoring on the stuff that's coming through uh, from the repairs reporting uh, now that we've got that particular schedule of rate code it does allow us to track that through and it's really just making sure that when we do get a report of damp and mold we have a proper investigation approach to it that sort of takes us right through to treatment and then ongoing monitoring so that's sort of where we are at the moment like i say i think you know for the future it's more around developing that policy and sort of how we action it and buying in some equipment uh, to allow us to do that monitoring which hopefully will either help to identify cause and also help to support people in prevention rather than sort of treatments so that was it for me thanks thanks paul it's really comprehensive thank you um i completely support the purchase of the, you know the deployment of 
monitoring equipment and even else you need i think that's really important um i also you know really support the uh, messaging sending flyers out to people um i wonder if, if there's any more we can do i'm not entirely sure there is possibly something we can put out on our facebook and our comms and our website just generally for people of tamworth because uh, i don't think it's patronizing to tell people how to kind of you know ensure their homes are um, better prepared for this kind of thing i think that's really important um, and also you, the point you made towards the end about um, the process of people reporting it and then it, you know, actioned. I think some people think it happens instantly. And we've had a few, you know, people run off to the press recently and say, oh, there's damp and mold in, in my home. And it turns out they've only reported it a week or so before. And, you know, we've got to fully investigate that. And it's only a, the odd case that happens that. But I think that, um, you know, there's lots of different reasons for damp and mold. Some of it um, you went into there. So I think... It, it's definitely a really good start this i really think we should carry on and, and push this further because it's uh it's clearly not something we want to be dealing with um michelle thanks alex um, and yeah thanks for that paul i think just kind of following on from what alex has just said oh sorry council Farrell has just said um even like basic things like on the leaflet where it says kind of two people active for a day will likely release up to three pints of water I think that's just two people and I don't think people necessarily realize that as facts so actually promoting kind of general causes nine pints if you dry your clothes well an awful lot of people do that um, and that puts water into the atmosphere and it has to go somewhere and if that hits a wall and builds up over time we, we need to keep getting those messages out there and looking at doing it in different ways across different platforms i think also when you look at from april gas prices are going to go up another 20 percent or so this problem isn't going to end in the short term and i suppose there's also a cost associated with repairs on this as well so again what what's why is the average cost would be really interesting to kind of know of a repair relating to cost and of, of damp and mould and actually how can that be potentially offset by other measures I, not necessarily saying for an answer now but again something to kind of consider and especially as this kind of moves forward the use of monitoring materials hopefully most individuals who are suffering with damp or mould in their property would be happy to do that and to kind of find out what it is yes there's a kind of an inconvenience of having a monitor but again it's stressing to people that this isn't we're not checking what time you put your washing on and <laughs> what time you have a shower in the morning this is here to do in the, no in the same way as we do with noisy neighbours or something similar and putting that sort of um, monitoring equipment out and about but so yeah fully support kind of the recommendations within the report it's just this isn't an issue that's going to go away anytime soon and I think that general messaging out there and making sure things like when people report leaks they are given this as a standard of saying this is your information and dare I say tailoring it to those particular issues because they are different to normal general day-to-day -day living um, but yeah, anything we can do to give people advice and support, even if it's just free advice or putting people out, um, it is really, really important. And my final point as well is utilising the likes of Ofgem and the power companies as well and their kind of um, vulnerable people groups that can kind of give that extra support or help with bills and not sitting there, sitting freezing, because come and ask a question. And again, we've got enough voluntary groups and also TBC and others that will work with people. Not necessarily saying we can fix every issue, but at least working with people to get that advice and guidance. But yeah, it's just a sad state of affairs ultimately. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cook. I think we're in agreement here. Um, the full support of the committee of two um, that we should uh, purchase any deployment or um, monitoring equipment that you need, uh, and and also just pass the message on. You know that it's not all. Uh, you know, tenants themselves can't always help the situation. And um, there's sometimes matters uh, out of their control. But you know, ventilation and doing the right thing is is highly recommended. 
um, I don't think we necessarily need to pass any recommendations here, do we? We just oh, we'll take that to the next level. Happy to move that we uh, we support the purchase of the deployment of anything you need, um, and if, you, if I need to sign it off at a level, send it my way. Thanks. I'm happy to second. And if you want to go back to the previous report and do the same on the yeah. other way, that's absolutely need, fine as well. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? I, I sorry. I felt the last one was more of a noting the report mentally rather than anything else. But <laughs> happy to sign off whatever you need, Tracy for the admin. Okay, are we happy to move on Paul to your, your next starring role um, about the uh, implementation of price per property for housing repairs uh, progress report. Thanks Paul. Yeah, no, thanks Chair. I mean this one is only brief because it's really is just a bit of an update on where we are with things so that uh, so that you're aware. Obviously you'll be aware we brought a, a paper through to this committee a while back uh, talking about the implementation of price per property and Equans came in and did a bit of a presentation for members. Uh, that was approved by Cabinet in December, and since then we've been working closely with uh, Equans to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we've been working closely with Equans to work on the implement uh, implementation of it. So so far we've scoped out the process with the contractor. We've started to identify the various work streams that will fall into planned works that will be outside of price per property. We. We're developing the new schedule of rates codes to address price per property. Uh, we pretty much agreed the level of detail that was required when logging repairs uh, and sort of the housing management side of stuff and how that will capture the price per property model and repairs. Uh, budgets are put forward now for the budget setting process to take account of the price per property model and the repairs policy is just being reviewed and updated to take account of that and to pick up the items covered in the last uh, item around damp and condensation before that gets released as a final version in April. Training for the staff both on our end and with Equans has taken place and they're being briefed on that at the moment. Uh, and a key piece of work for us at the moment is making sure we close out all of the current jobs that are in the old scheduler rate system prior to the 31st of March so that we haven't got any carry forward into the next period. I think you know we've raised this previously that the key the key outcomes from this that we'd expect to see is that we move away from those quantitative checks on completed works to more qualitative checks. Uh, less bean counting and more looking at the quality and how it impacts on tenants in, in terms of the works that are actually done in their homes. Uh, making sure that repairs that are reported are completed so that the stuff that's coming through the front door for us actually gets done. We are in a good position on that because we took the call centre back in house so we know what's been reported and we can then trace that through and track it, you know, track the progress of repairs. Uh, always more difficult where the contractors take in the repairs calls because you, you don't know what they're coming through the front door at any given point in time and a key for us is now working with the contractor to sort of maximize the benefits of the price per property in particular around sort of that concept of if we attend a property to do a repair that the tenants reported and we turn up at the property and there are other repairs to be done that we actually do as much as that property as we possibly can in that one visit regardless of whether it's been reported previously or not uh, that way from the tenant's point of view obvious benefit you know the repair report one repair and get 10 done if that's what's needed from the contractor's point of view it means they're only going to that property once and not having to keep returning because as you'd appreciate every time you have to go to a property that's a journey so there's petrol usage or diesel usage there's the time taken to travel, which is non-productive, and that all adds up over time. So the idea is, is that you actually lose a lot of that non-productive time and non-productive costs. It won't work on day one in, in that sense. It's going to take a build up to it because I think, you know, everyone's going to have to get used to it. Uh, but it works in other areas. It's not a new, it's nothing new. It's tried and tested in a lot of areas. Uh, and. A, a good proportion of current repairs contracts for social housing are let on that basis. So it's a well-known model. Uh, so at the moment, no particular reasons why we can't be up and running from April. We haven't done any formal comms on it at the moment uh, because I think, you know, the view is let's soft launch it. 
from a tenant perspective, nothing changes in terms of how they report repairs and what, what they need to do. So they still just phone through to report the repair. They've always been able to report multiple repairs if they've got multiple repairs at the time. As, as we start getting into it and making it work and making sure things are happening properly, I think then probably, you know, sort of, sort of later in the spring, that's the time to really push it and publicise it so that people are saying, oh, actually, now you're coming out, there's my list of repairs. So on the doorstep, it's almost like, there you go, that's what I need doing today type of thing. Because that's probably the better use of the operative's time and it makes the system work. But we, I think we just need to ease into it. Uh, but I don't see any reason at the moment why that can't happen. We'll keep it under close review. Uh, it's got to work for us and for the contractor and for the tenants. And if it's not working, then we need to sort of go back to the drawing board and see what we can do to make things work. Uh, but like I say, it's it's not a new, it's not nothing innovative. It's not we're not doing anything out the ordinary or innovative on this one. It's a commonplace form of contracting, so there's no reason why it shouldn't work. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm a big fan of price per property. Uh, we've had many meetings about it. I think it cuts the bureaucracy out from both sides, for, from the council side, from Equans' side, um, from the residents' side. Um, I think it's very helpful. I think you're right. I don't think it needs comms, really. It doesn't really need a ribbon cutting. It's the same as, um, and hopefully a better service for, for everyone involved. Um, so um, the only thing I'd like to see is just better comments from you know residents to say how they enjoyed the service. And if they do that, they're clearly doing it right. Michelle? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with what Councillor Harrell's just said. I'd actually, actually make propose that we change the recommendation to a committee endorses the contents of this report get on and do it as quickly as possible and I think in terms of comms it's back-end process change ultimately I think the service enhancements absolutely we should be promoting those but residents whilst we obviously want best use of taxpayer resources this gives certainty on both sides and hopefully, if it cuts out some of the kind of the dead time as well, even better because people ultimately want things repaired and in a quick manner. So, yeah, I think it's in everyone's best interest to get this out and sorted as quickly as possible. Thank you. Yep, I look forward to the implementation, uh, hopefully in, in April. Um, and I completely agree with Councillor Cook. Uh, I move that we uh, endorse these uh, this progress uh, report and uh, look forward to the future and look for a seconder. Happy to second, thanks. Good, happy Paul. Thank you and thank you uh, for Councillor Cook joining me for this lovely meeting. <laughs>